is Lennart Woltering. I work for CIMIT, the International Maize and Wheat uh, uh, Improvement Center in Mexico. I'm also the, the, the chair of the Community of Practice uh, Agricultural Working Group um, um, on Scaling. And that's a group of about 150 people, donors, implementers, researchers, really passionate about scaling. So if you want to join that as well, um, yeah, write me an email. I think this is a beautiful marriage between the two communities of practice, one on scaling and one on big data. Everything is big, right? So I'm happy to introduce the second webinar. Um, we, um, uh, we kicked off two months ago with a webinar um, on scaling, basically the why and the what and what is scaling actually. We had a lot of um, good feedback on that and we are very enthusiastic to kick off the second one. And this is really into the science of scaling. And I think it's important that we recognize that scaling not just is an art, it's really something you do, but it's also a science, right? It's the science of the implementation. And there's still a lot we don't know on how to scale. Um, but the other question is who is actually doing the scaling and how do the people in the field learn from the people that are learning and studying scaling and vice versa, how do you get this uh, machine going? Now, this is a big topic and I'm not doing this alone. I'm very happy to be flanked by, by Daniel and he's going to introduce himself shortly. Yeah, thanks, Leonard. So I'll introduce myself. I'm Daniel Jimenez. I'm the leader of the community of practice on, on data-driven uh, agronomy. I'm very pleased to see you all attending. So just to remind you that the, this community of practice uh, is part of the uh, one CGR initiative called the Big Data Platform in Agriculture, which works to harness the capabilities of big data to solve agricultural problems in a faster, better, and at greater scale. And as we say, like feeding the future bite to bite, right? So one of the main goals of the community of practice is, is actually to facilitate and communicate collective action on a particular topic across the CGIR and its partners, nonprofit organization, for profit, academy, etc. So that is precise, that is exactly what we want to do here today, which is basically bringing virtually our colleagues uh, to share our, uh, their experiences, in this case on scaling their the projects in different geographies. So I think uh, we can start now and I'll hand over to Lena, who will introduce our first speaker. Yes, yeah, so we have some great speakers lined up and I'm gonna introduce the first one and I'm gonna introduce him in, in the really the Dutch way. And it is Mark Schut. Uh, he is a senior innovation and scaling scientist at the CJR and at Wageningen University in the Netherlands. He is based in uh, Rwanda and he leads the Roots, Tubers and Banana um, group uh, flagship uh, on scaling. So Mark, without further ado, I give you the virtual floor and you have 15 minutes presentation. Then we move on with Haley, and then we have uh, space for Q&A for both. Thank you so much, Mark. Floor is yours. Thank you so much, Leonard. I'm uh, just going to ask uh, one of you to confirm that you can see my screen. Well, we can see it, Mark. That's perfect. Okay, great. Uh, first of all, um, thank you uh, to the conveners of the of the platform for providing me with an opportunity to share some of the exciting work that we are doing on uh, scaling of innovation in the CJR or in the research for development uh, context. Um, the work that I will present will be presenting today is not uh, uh, just my work. Uh, it's the work that's been conducted by a team of very enthusiastic uh, CGIR scientists uh, plus uh, lead scientists from Wageningen University uh, on innovation and uh, scaling of innovation for uh, achieving societal outcomes. So. Um, I think we all agree that uh, if we are serious about achieving the sustainable development goals, then we need to think about impact at scale and the use of uh, agricultural innovation at scale. Uh, when we started our journey as part of the CJR Roots, Tubers and Bananas um, CRP, uh, a couple of years ago, I, I don't think uh, scaling was as a hot topic as today. Uh, there, was, uh, there were a couple of communities, uh, for example, the Scaling Up Nutrition community, uh, but uh, I think we, many of our colleagues um, were still in the mode of uh, agricultural extension, adoption of innovation, transfer of technology. And I think the scaling terminology has really uh, taken off over the recent uh, years. 
there's a couple of reasons why uh, we have not been so good at achieving impact at scale. Uh, I've listed a few here, and we often refer to that as scaling the old way, where we only start thinking about use of innovation uh, in the last phase of our projects and programs. We still have three, four months left, and uh, then we start thinking like, okay, so now how do we uh, reach our targets? Or oh, let's start printing flyers and handing them, handing them out to the farmers. Let's develop a policy brief and make sure it ends up with the minister. Um, and I think um, more and more we, we, we understand that uh, achieving impact at scale does not uh, work uh, like that. Uh, some other reasons for why um, uh, our results have been rather disappointing is uh, that um, we often don't design with scale in mind. Uh, again, this is related to uh, first thinking about innovation, then uh, about the use of innovation at, at scale. Uh, we also often have unrealistic ideas about uh, what it takes to achieve impact at scale or, or have impact. So something that is just a good idea and then we write a proposal and two and a half years later or three years later, we expect that two million farmers are using um, these, these innovations and, and, and thinking that we can go through a, a process of, of designing, testing, validating and, and um, uh, promoting use. Um, so this, this is another reason. Um, often we, we think that what works in one location or in one context, we can simply copy paste uh, to other contexts and then it will achieve similar outcomes and, and results and we know um, from uh, the science of scaling uh, that, uh, that it, it doesn't work uh, like that. Today uh, what I will be talking about is mainly the, uh, the result of a, an initiative that we started uh, I think two years ago um, in, in collaboration with Elsevier's Agricultural Systems uh, Journal. Uh, we decided to um, open a call uh, for uh, as part of a special issue uh, on the science of scaling. And our uh, title was to connect the pathways of agricultural research and development for improving food income and nutrition uh, security. And uh, the initiative was taken by myself together with uh, Professor Kees Lewis uh, from Wageningen University and uh, Dr. Graham Thiel, who is the director for the uh, CJR research program on roots, tubers and bananas. And we opened this call um, with the idea that probably uh, there's more people out there who are thinking about how we can use scientific methods, tools, and theories to do a better job at uh, scaling of innovation, particularly for the research for development sector. And we wanted to source uh, those kinds of successes, but also the failures. Uh, so in our call, we were pretty um, clear that uh, we wanted to have success stories, but we were also very open about publishing some of the a good the, the projects and the programs that had good intention but but maybe did not receive uh, uh, achieve what they wanted to achieve uh, and uh, i think only three or four weeks ago uh, we concluded the uh, the special issue journey uh, with uh, publishing the editorial and most of the um, the things that i will be talking about today is are based on the editorial and uh, the editorial was basically a, um, a synthesis of the 10 publications that finally made it into the, uh, into the special issue. Now, I thought before we uh, start talking about the main uh, lessons learned, uh, it's probably good to define uh, the science of scaling. And I copied the, the definition that we used in the, in the editorial. And, and there we refer to the design, testing, validation, and use of scientific theories, concepts, and methods to better understand and guide a scaling of innovation to achieve societal outcomes. So just before somebody starts asking, um, how do you define the science of scaling? I, I thought it would be good to, uh, to give this uh, definition upfront. Um, I, I, I've copied uh, several hyperlinks into my presentation um, that will allow you to, to both find the summary page of the special issue, but also the, the editorial. Now we had, as I said before, we had 10 publications uh, in the special issue, um, uh, cutting across three different categories. Uh, we had two publications that focused on understanding uh, scaling trajectories retrospectively, so uh, ex post uh, from a long-term uh, systems perspective. So more looking back uh, at a trajectory of, for example, uh, developing uh, the testing, validating, uh, scaling orange flesh sweet potato, um, and, and here we are talking about trajectories of, of maybe 20, 15 to 20 years 
and trying to understand like what what made this um, uh, innovation uh, used at scale uh, and trying to draw some lessons from that. Uh, then we had a couple of publications that reflected on scaling efforts as part of more short term projects or, or as we call them R4D interventions, agricultural research for development interventions. Uh, and trying to see like how does that fit within how do projects short term projects fit within these longer term trajectory trajectories of uh, of innovation design and use and then we had a couple of papers that focus more on uh, conceptual and methodological approaches aimed at guiding uh, scaling ex ex ante so um, before you actually start a project or a program or any kind of intervention uh, what are the methods and tools out there that can uh, help us to do a better job so I will be talking about the, the seven um, uh, key lessons learned um, from the, the editorial, and you can find more detail uh, on each of them uh, in, in the paper. So the first one is that uh, innovation scale as part of packages. And uh, what, it, what does that mean? Um, very often we are thinking about innovations, for example, a new crop variety, and we want to scale this new uh, crop variety. So if you ask people, what is it that you're trying to scale in your project? And they say, okay, it's my vitamin A rich banana, or it is my um, uh, small uh, tractor, or it is my uh, whatever have you. Um, but the fact is that th these kinds of technologies or these kinds of innovations, they don't scale alone. For them to scale, so for this new crop variety to scale, you also need novel seed uh, quality assurance policies, you need certi uh, seed certification, you need, maybe need uh, to, to organize uh, pro-poor pro access to finance, maybe you need to organize your seed producers, uh, you need to develop a business model, you need to organize demonstration plots at scale to, um, to show people why this new crop variety is better or different from, from others. And all of these things uh, need to be in place in a specific context uh, for the new crop variety actually to serve uh, the purpose uh, for farmers. So for example, have lead to better productivity or to um, uh, that can then lead to better income or to better food security uh, at the household level. So first and foremost, we need to think about innovations as part of these packages or innovation packages as, as we call them. And we need to think about like, are all of these conditions in place? Um, or are some of them lacking or are they some of them causing bottlenecks? So for example, your new crop variety can be perfect, but if the seed system is not functioning, then this crop variety will probably not uh, end up contributing to a specific uh, outcome. So it's important we think of about innovations and the scaling of innovations as part of packages, that such packages are context specific so that uh, even uh, one side of the country versus the other side of the country or Nigeria versus Tanzania, the, the conditions are always different. Um, and so we need to think about that in terms of context. We need to uh, think about packages uh, as, as, as both uh, consisting of technological and non-technological innovations. And often in CGIR, for example, we focus very much on the technological side of things, but not so much on the policies and the seed systems and the partnerships and the business models. And that um, each of these innovations is uh, in a package that they have different levels of, of what we call readiness and use. So um, I will refer to uh, other work later uh, that, that uh, elaborates on that. And the second lesson learned from, um, uh, from the special issue and, and the publications is that several of the, of the publications were actually um, referring to the fact that a focus on numbers, trying to achieve as many as possible, is really creating wrong incentives uh, in our systems. So for example, here in this picture, you see the lady with the red hat. Let's say that she is a researcher and she says to the farmers, I'll give you 10 US dollars if you adopt this new variety. And the farmer um, says like, I don't like the taste and there's no market, but anyway, let me take the $10 and, uh, and, and adopt it. And then this kind of uh, incentive systems or these kinds of mechanisms often end up in uh, situations where um, farmers use an innovation, uh, but but not for the right reasons. Um, we uh, we are very much pushed, all of us, by achieving uh, or or uh, reaching many, and um, it 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 is not uh, um, uh, the way to go, uh, and it's creating the wrong incentives, as I've uh, as I've said before. The third lesson learned is that. Um, 
uh, and this is a combination of, of uh, what we saw in the special issue, the longer, longer term change uh, papers versus the short term projects papers, is that most of the, the change processes that actually lead to the use of uh, innovation at scale, that they take anywhere in between uh, 15 and 20 years. And um, in the cases where um, there, is a, there is a success, for example, uh, orange flesh sweet potato, we really found that there is some champions, uh, some, some people uh, that have a strong leadership that can navigate the development, testing and use of innovations across different project cycles. So they have been there from day one until the last day um, uh, and they have navigated uh, the, their innovation through all these projects and every time addressed new bottlenecks uh, and made sure that, um, uh, that the innovation is actually being, being used uh, at scale together with that team, of course. Uh, what we often see in, in, uh, in, in the CGIR system and in many also other research for development organizations and systems is that there's many short projects Sometimes they, um, they overlap in terms of one project ending, the other one starting. Sometimes there, there is a big gap in between projects where partnerships devolve. Uh, people that have the institutional memory or the innovation memory, they go into other jobs, they leave the organization. And you know, once a new project starts, we, we have to start from scratch uh, almost. So there's a lot of um, problems actually being caused by uh, trying to map short-term projects into longer-term um, uh, systems of, of, of change. One of the, uh, the other lessons that um, uh, kept on coming back is that scaling is not the same or research, uh, oh, sorry, innovation use is not the same as uh, innovation uh, design, testing and, and validation. In other words, scaling is not necessarily the same as uh, what we do uh, in, in the scientific endeavor. So um, there is a real strong need to have more scaling champions uh, that have uh, other kinds of competences, comp complementary competences uh, compared to researchers. So people who are much more opportunistic, that understand the needs and the demands uh, of, of policymakers and private sector uh, and can, um, can help us, for example, also to, um, uh, to translate our research innovations into products uh, that actually fit or, or uh, align well with the systems that uh, private sector and, and, uh, and public sector are using. So this really also requires new institutional arrangement and conditions, so much more flexibility, uh, really listening to what are the demands of our partners, the next users, the end users, uh, but also new partnership models. So for example, not so much us uh, approaching a scaling partner saying like, hey, we have a project, are you interested? Um, we already have the resources, these are the objectives, these are the outputs, um, do you want to partner with us? But much more designing uh, partnership models together and also trying to get co-investment uh, from uh, our scaling partners. This puts them much stronger in terms of the driving seat uh, and also make sure that they really negotiate for what they want uh, uh, to get out of it. Um, yeah. The fifth lesson learned is that, um, you know, uh, with scale, scale, trying to achieve scale goes hand in hand with uh, having limited control over the way uh, your innovation is being used or abused uh, at scale. And this really requires a little bit of a different mindset um, because we, we really as scientists and as R4D organizations, um, especially with a public, uh, a, a public mandate, we really want to be in control. And also many of our donors and many of the people that invest in us, they want, us, uh, they want that their investment translates into responsible innovations that are then being used in a responsible way uh, by, by both men and women of different age and of different ethnic back background and all these things uh, together. But what is very important is that once innovations starting, uh, are starting to be used at scale, we have to accept that we have limited controllability. And um, that is a, it, has, it has some major uh, implications of, of how we think about uh, responsible scaling and how we're also trying to, um, uh, to support that. Uh, the uh, lesson six uh, is about the, the partnerships. What we really found is that, um, the, that many research for development organizations, they work with the same partners 
uh, both in innovation development and design and testing, and then also into um, into phases of, of, of projects where, where it's more about um, the scaling of innovation. I think um, several of the papers, they describe situations where uh, the partners uh, really need to be fit for purpose. So if I go back to the earlier example of scaling the new crop variety, if the, the key bottleneck is providing access to, to credit for the farmers, then obviously you need to work with uh, the credit providers, maybe with the banks or with microfinance institutions. If your bottleneck is to improve uh, government seed systems, then obviously you start working or putting more emphasis on, uh, on, on, on partners who can improve uh, government seed systems and with the government uh, themselves, obviously. And I think in many of the, the scaling projects or programs where we are involved, the choice of partners made actually before we analyze or have a good idea about what is the real bottleneck for scaling this innovation. Once we get an, a better idea of what are the bottlenecks, then we can uh, think about what kind of activities, what kind of partnerships would actually be most efficient to overcome those bottlenecks and not the other way around. So we first identify the partners without having a clear assessment of uh, what are the bottlenecks for scaling and, and what is the most efficient strategy to, to deal with them. Um, the last lesson uh, actually is a, is a bit of a, of a broader reflection, um, but this is maybe going a little bit beyond uh, you know, our, uh, the way we refer to scaling of innovation. And we refer to that as um, a new paradigm or a new wave of thinking, which we, we call scaling outcomes. So I think we all um, uh, remember that you know, in transfer of technology, um, which is a bit like the old way uh, of thinking about scaling, we have a proven technology uh, that works in a specific location, let's say an improved chicken breed. We have other uh, locations where we think this improved chicken breed can also serve a specific purpose, for example, uh, contribute to, to improved nutrition. We think about an extension mechanisms, uh, mechanism, for example, um, uh, you know, uh, training of trainers uh, in a national agricultural research or extension system. And, and we try to bring this technology um, uh, to these different locations with a joint uh, outcome of, of improving nutrition. This is a little bit uh, scaling the old way, not thinking too much about like what are the specific si the site specific needs, what are the innovation packages, and etc. I think this, the second wave uh, of thinking about uh, uh, scaling scaling of innovation or the use of innovation at scale is already a little bit more this this um, uh, this way of thinking of of innovations as part of packages. So. Let's say um, we have a proven innovation package that works in a specific location. So the package is an improved chicken breed, uh, credit facility and access to the market. Then we think about, okay, uh, what are the specific uh, bottlenecks in the other locations where we think this innovation package can, can be useful. Uh, so let's say that in uh, location B, um, the, the key bottleneck is access to the breed. In location C, the key bottleneck is access to credit. And location D, the key bottleneck is access to the market. And then uh, we develop a strategy around that and still we, uh, we use this one innovation, so the improved chicken breed, uh, to improve um, these nutrition outcomes. Now, the third wave um, of thinking about scaling of innovation actually turns this whole way of thinking upside down. So it actually starts from the outcome. So it starts about like, what is it actually that you want to achieve? And if you ask many of the development donors or you ask, for example, governments, like, what are your main problems? They say like, well, in the north of our country, really uh, nutrition is, is a big issue. They don't, they are not so much um, uh, concerned about which kind of specific innovation will solve that problem. They want to solve that problem. So if we then think about locations where this problem exists and we think about what are the scaling ready innovations that we have in these different locations, then maybe uh, for a location A, we are uh, considering improved chicken breeds. For location B, we are considering orange flesh sweet potato. And for location C, we are considering a vitamin A supplement, for example, if that is the most uh, ready uh, innovation to be used at scale. So what you see here is that we are not so much trying to scale the innovation. Um, we are not so much trying to think about scaling as in one innovation to be used by many people in many different locations, but we are trying to think about 
what innovation is proven, tested, validated for that location to actually improve that outcome. In this case, improve nutrition. You can imagine that this in the CGIR, for example, this has all kinds of political implications because probably, you know, if, you, if your innovation X is the improved chicken breed, then you work with Ilri. If your uh, innovation for location B is orange flesh sweet potato, you work with SIP and if uh, the International Potato Center, and if your innovation for location C is a vitamin A supplement, you probably have to look for your main partner outside of uh, the, the CGIR. Um, so under one CGIR, this is probably a more likely um, uh, a paradigm of thinking about scaling. But actually, I think the more we think about it, it actually makes a lot of sense. You know? Not trying to, uh, to, to scale one specific solutions in many different locations, but think more like for this specific location, for this target group, for this outcome, what is the best solution? And then of course you uh, tailor your scaling strategy um, uh, around um, overcoming the bottlenecks for the use of this uh, chicken breed, uh, orange flesh sweet potato or um, vitamin A supplement. Uh, this is my last slide. Um, towards the end of the editorial of the special issue, we present a research agenda uh, for the science of scaling. So this is based on reflection uh, from the 10 publications um, where we basically identify three different research domains. Uh, so the first one is really about understanding the big picture of scaling. Um, um, so we need much more examples like the one on orange flesh sweet potato that really look back on 15, 20 years of, of, of efforts um, on of, of scaling innovation and trying to understand like, okay, what were the tipping points? What were the success factors? Uh, how did they deal with, uh, with, with bottlenecks or changing in context and, and et cetera? And there also we should look at other sectors, uh, the health sector, the education sector, uh, the private sector, uh, the public sector, and really trying to understand better how scaling really works in practice. Um, first and foremost, to develop a more realistic idea of uh, uh, how does it happen and how can we how can we strengthen it. The second research domain focuses more on what are then the instruments, so the methods, the approaches, the tools uh, that can help us uh, in an ex ante way to design better, uh, more efficient uh, scaling strategies. So based on the learning from research domain one, how can we use this learning? to do a better job in, uh, uh, in trying to achieve impact at scale. And, and then the third research domain is, is much more about uh, what kind of, how can we create better uh, conducive environments and conditions uh, for scaling innovation. So this has much more to do with how can we reorganize our systems, the way we think about uh, our partnerships, the way we do monitoring and evaluation and learning uh, to better accommodate uh, the scaling of innovation. And, you know, of course, all these three research domains, they are interrelated and connected, although some of them are a bit more theory oriented and uh, some of them are a bit more action oriented. Much of what I've uh, talked about today um, actually are, are uh, some of the underlying principles of an approach uh, that we have been developing uh, and that is currently being used already in some of the CJR programs, which is called scaling readiness. Uh, if you're curious about uh, this approach um, that really tries to translate some of those fundamental principles about scaling into, um, uh, you know, into a support system that, that helps people, projects uh, and organizations to develop better scaling strategies, uh, then please visit uh, the website uh, www.scalingready.com. Thank you so much, Mark. Great presentation. We already have quite a lot of questions popping in, but we're moving on uh, with Haley and Daniel, you're going to introduce her. Uh, okay, can you, can you guys hear me now? Hello, hello? Yeah, we can hear you, Daniel. Okay, good. So now I'll introduce Haley. So Haley is a program officer with the Policy and Evaluation Division at IDRC. For those who don't know what IDRC stands for, this is the International Development Research Center. Uh, Haley is a co-author of the recently published scaling playbook 
which provides um, practical guidance for researchers aiming to scale results. So she, be, she will be sharing with us some of the IDRC work on scaling science. And specifically, she will, she will walk us through the principles of scaling science based on the IDRC research. So let me hand you over to Haley. Haley? Hi, thanks very much, Daniel and um, colleagues, um, for giving me this opportunity to um, share, as you mentioned, IDRC's um, work to date on understanding um, the scaling science and approaches um, to integrating this into our work. Um, hopefully everyone can see my presentation on the screen now. Um, so just to jump right in, um, for IDRC, there are really two meanings um, to this term scaling science. It's a bit of a play on words for us. Um, so first, we can talk about the science of scaling, by which we mean an empirical understanding of scaling and how it can increase the likelihood that innovations benefit society. Secondly, it can refer in particular to the scaling of scientific research results for the public good. Um, for us, given our focus on scaling and research for development, these two are intertwined. Um, but I'll spend most of the time today talking about um, the science of scaling, so to speak, um, given it's uh, the theme for this webinar. So IDRC's efforts towards understanding the science of scaling started in 2016 when we commenced a retrospective review of the scaling experiences of Southern innovators in a range of disciplines and sectors that IDRC supports. Um, so we reviewed about 150 IDRC supported research projects to define common characteristics and anomalies of these scaling experiences. And then we applied what we took from this review to a limited set of in-depth case studies to test what had come out um, of this broader review. So the results of this were published in a book um, by John Gargani and my colleague Robert McLean um, called Scaling Impact, Innovation for the Public Good. And what we learned through this study, um, in essence, is there's no blueprint for scaling in R4D. Scaling can take place through a range of pathways, um, policy change, behavioral change, products and technologies, methodologies. What we did identify, and these are at the core of our understanding of scaling for impact, um, are a, study, a set of common principles that guide scaling efforts across the range of projects we reviewed. So these form our definition of scaling impact as a coordinated effort to achieve a collection of impacts at optimal scale that's only undertaken if morally justified and warranted by the dynamic evaluation of evidence. Um, so for those who attended the first webinar in this series, um, we've seen that a key issue in scaling is this question of how can we get from a pilot or an experiment, um, something taking place in a well-defined environment, um, to scaling by reaching the real world context where the results of our innovations can have the best impact. So for us, these guiding principles are really a flexible set of considerations um, that help us to take action on scaling in diverse and dynamic contexts. So I'm gonna spend most of the rest of this presentation explaining each of these principles in more detail, um, and also trying to illustrate each with reference to one of the in-depth case studies from our scaling science study. Um, and it's on scaling a nutrition intervention in this case. Um, so in this project, researchers supported by IDRC and Global Affairs Canada set out to assess the viability of fortifying locally produced unrefined sunflower oil um, with vitamin A to address a common micronutrient deficiency in two rural regions of Tanzania. Um, they were also looking at the viability of marketing and distributing the project, or the product rather, um, at the time, the government of Tanzania was um, in the process of drafting policy that would make fortification of edible oils mandatory, um, which presented a problem for local producers because there was no known process um, for fortifying the unrefined oil that, that they produced. So just in the framing of this case study, we can already start to see the principle um, of justification coming into play. So this principle says very basically that the choice to scale, and it is a choice, not an imperative, um, must be justified. And it should be justified based on technical evidence, but also on values that help to determine whether and what impacts are worth pursuing. Um, so given this value judgment, the decision should also be shared by, by those who are affected um, by scaling. So going back to our case study, um, 
of technical evidence, they first conducted a technical study that showed the, sh the shelf stability of fortified unrefined sunflower oil. So they knew it was technically possible to produce and technically it could be justified. But why bother? As I've mentioned, um, vitamin A deficiency was a widely identified health risk for vulnerable populations in Tanzania. Um, and addressing this through fortification was going to complement a government policy that was in development. Um, there was also a clear local economic benefit given local producers were depending on selling unrefined sunflower oil and um, soon would not be able to sell their product without fortification. Um, so this was also aligning with um, development goals and values were placed on um, this solution. Our second principle um, within our definition is optimal scale, which is basically challenging the bigger is better logic um, that we see in some other scaling paradigms. So it says that more isn't necessarily better, and it recognizes that scaling produces a collection of impacts. And so we actually need to be considering the trade-offs between um, the magnitude of impacts, just how many people are we reaching, for example, but also the variety of impacts. Is it having different impacts for different groups? Does this have equity implications? And are those impacts going to be sustainable without ongoing intervention? So in the case of the sunflower oil project, we can see a few considerations that they would have looked at to try to consider these trade-offs um, in impact. Obviously, they wanted to know whether there were gonna be increases in vitamin A levels in populations in the target regions and just the magnitude of that impact. Um, they'd also need to consider um, economic impacts, so including how the marketing the intervention would help enterprises meet demand in the regions, or inhibit this, as well as the cost effectiveness of production and, if, um, and the effects on affordability of the fortified oil, oil for um, lowest income households. Um, so the, in turn, some equity considerations would need to be addressed in this project. Our third principle is coordination. So acknowledging that as we've seen, scaling occurs in complex systems. Um, we need to have a flexible scaling process in place. Um, and this means we're, we're going beyond targeting a specific knowledge user in one context to consider the broader scaling system and connect with an evolving range of actors and um, systems that can enable or inhibit uh, the impact of our innovation. Um, so in the case of our sunflower oil case study, um, moving from just this discovery that indeed we can fortify unrefined sunflower oil into really bringing this um, into practice, and um, we'd need to engage production engineers, manufacturers, and private investment to have this produced. And then researchers also engage with government um, to align with regulatory processes and policies that were coming into um, effect. Um, they determined that distributors were a key liaison between manufacturers and retailers and had to add them um, into their scaling strategy at some point. And of course, they needed to consider the practices um, and preferences of retailers and consumers if they wanted um, this innovation to reach um, those that they were, um, the level at which they were trying to have impact. So finally, our fourth principle is um, dynamic evaluation. So given scaling is a dynamic and evolving process, how can we build in consideration of this um, and consider on an ongoing basis who we should be engaging with? Um, what are the trade-offs um, that affect our understanding of optimal impact? Um, so dynamic evaluation, it's not a methodology per se, but it's a stance that says scaling in itself is an, interve an intervention that's worth evaluating. Um, and it generates dynamic change. So we can't just assess the extent to which an intervention has achieved a particular impact at a given time. Um, we need to consider and measure a collection of impacts over time and build in uh, learning loops that inform our scaling efforts accordingly. So in the case of our sunflower oil project, naturally they wanted to monitor the nutritional effects of fortified sunflower oil in the populations and target regions. To do this, they needed to ensure a steady supply of the fortified unrefined oil to these populations. 
and they needed to consider the effectiveness of their commercial approach in doing so. Um, originally, they used an e-voucher system where consumers downloaded coupons and passed these on um, to vendors and manufacturers for reimbursement. Um, but through their ongoing assessment of this, they learned it was too time consuming and it wasn't working as planned. Um, it further required the use of barcodes on individual units sold um, in order to track um, the sale. But um, they learned that consumers in low income households typically could only afford to purchase oil in small quantities by the scoop. Um, so through ongoing assessment of their approach, um, they were able to adjust and adopt more direct sub subsidies and also to begin selling oil by the scoop in a way that it would actually reach um, the consumers that they wanted the product to get to. So ultimately, this project demonstrated the feasibility of producing fortified unrefined sunflower oil and its potential to help reduce micronutrient deficiency. Um, it revealed some challenges to address in any future scaling work including, for example, the affordability of the process um, as rolled out. In this case, the production equipment, for example, was quite expensive, um, but potential was identified for future scaling, potentially at the national level, just noting that these challenges would remain to be addressed. Um, this is typical, um, as we regularly see, and I think Mark spoke to this in his presentation as well, scaling takes place regularly over the course of multiple projects. And the idea is to adjust along the way to address varied contexts um, and not just to kind of uniformly try to apply an approach um, at other scales. So I'll just note as well that this was a retrospective application of, of the four principles um, as a part of our scaling science study. Um, naturally, and as I think Mark spoke to as well. The next step for us was to take a forward-looking approach um, to how we can proactively apply these principles or enable their application in the work that we support. Um, so going back to our second meaning of scaling science, where we take a practical principles-based approach to the scaling impact of research for the public good. Um, to this end, we recently released um, the Scaling Playbook, which provides practical guidance for researchers interested in scaling to incorporate these principles throughout a research project. Um, we at IDRC see this, um, see scaling as an, an area of continued learning and hope that application of this guidance um, will lead to new case studies and new insights on the science of scaling. Um, I'll mention on this theme as well um, of continued learning that IDRC has an ongoing evaluation of our efforts to scale impact that will also be pro producing more insights. Um, and one survey is still open as a part of that evaluation for any funders in the audience who might wish to share their experiences. Um, so I can share a link to some of these resources in the chat as well as that survey. Um, but that's it for me for now and I'll look forward to your questions. Thank you, Haley and Mark, for, for the presentations. So there's a there's a there's a question that I just you know I picked from 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 our chat, and uh, it says that these presentations they really shed lights and help us unpack the concept of scaling, which for many for, for many of us is just about. For many, for many of us, it's just about a, a, a number, right? Like from 100 to, to 10,000. So irrespective of consideration of many non-technical non uh, non parameters. So do you think uh, something needs to be done uh, uh, in order to overcome that? I, so, I can maybe, sorry, <laughs> Go ahead. I was waiting for, for Haley to speak, but you know, I, I, I think it all starts with developing more realistic ideas about um, how scaling happens uh, in, in society. Um, what, are the, um, what is the role for, um, for scientists? What is the role of research for development organizations such as IDRC, such as CJR, such as uh, many of the other um, organizations that have the ambition to de design, test, validate uh, innovations and then of course uh, uh, see these innovations being used in society. Um, uh, so I think 
you know, it all starts with having a better understanding of how it happens, more realistic understanding of how it happens and start to, um, uh, to have a debate and a common understanding with the people who fund us, with the people who, um, uh, who, who work in our organizations and try to see if we can, all can get to the same page that if you want to really tackle uh, a problem and you start from scratch uh, designing and testing uh, specific kinds of ideas or hypotheses and innovations, that this will be a long-term endeavor. And um, I think it all, it all starts with that, you know, having the right mindset, uh, trying not to just uh, please people by um, ramping up figures, by uh, trying to sell uh, unrealistic ideas of what we can achieve in one and a half, two years, because in the end it will fire back at us um, because it, it, it doesn't work like that. And then um, we, are, uh, we are being blamed uh, for not having impact. So I think that is, that is really the starting point for me. Uh, so opening up that black box uh, and trying to understand better, how does it happen? What can we learn from other sectors? Uh, how does the private sector do marketing, for example? How is an organization like Apple or how is an organization like Syngenta, how are they constantly trying to develop new products, uh, test them with end users, develop partnerships um, that, that, that actually lead to a large scale um, marketing of these kinds of products, learn from that and trying to, uh, uh, to do better. So thank you, Mark. I don't know, Leonard, probably, you know, what, can you pick one question for Haley? Because we, we have like eight minutes left. <laughs> All right, thank you. That was a question I liked very much uh, for Haley. Um, from David Bosseli, is there a tipping point in the scaling process where systemic changes and adoption become self-sustaining and need no further support from projects? And if so, how do we establish where are those tipping points? Hmm. Um, yeah, that's a very good question. I don't know if there's kind of um, like a universally, universally applicable way of determining, determining what that tipping point would be in all cases, just given that there are so many kind of different pathways um, to scale. Um, but I would say that that is one of the factors that, that we would be measuring as one of the trade-offs in determining optimal scale. So it's one of the things that you definitely want to plan to be learning about through your scaling efforts in terms of, um, is this going to be affordable for people to continue to do in the absence of subsidies in the case that I described. Um, so really building in and again bringing in this principle of dynamic evaluation to try to get a sense of what are the factors that that will affect the, the sustainability of the impact um, of whatever it is that you are scaling. So it's not it's not a very definitive answer but I would encourage you to take up um, that principle as well in practice to try to, to come to that. And, What do you think, Daniel? One more question before you wrap up? Uh, yes, yes. Can you do it? All right. Um, there was a question on the who. Um, who is the right candidates to facilitate scaling? Are these researchers? Are these extensionists? Are these development practitioners? Maybe uh, Mark, what do you think? Who, who should, who, is, who are actually scaling? Who should do the scaling? Well, definitely not the scientists, uh, to be a little bit uh, provocative. I think um, if you look at large-scale uh, companies, they usually compart uh, com uh, compartmentalize themselves. Uh, and, and I think many of us associate that with something uh, that is negative. But in, this, uh, in each of the compartments, every uh, scientist or every um, actor or employee has their specific contribution to uh, designing, testing, validating innovations, and then uh, those that have been proven to work uh, are actually put in, 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 um, uh, in the market to try to reach as many people as possible. And I think, you know, scientists usually, by their nature, they are interested in trying out different things and trying to understand and see what works, trying to improve technologies, trying to improve uh, other types of innovations. And I think, you know, once a scientist has actually 
done their job and said like, okay, I've designed something that I think it, it works. We have tested it in under uh, uh, controlled and uncontrolled conditions. And, you know, we are pretty, um, uh, we are, uh, you know, pretty convinced that this actually can contribute to better productivity or uh, better nutrition for young children and all these kind of things. I think, you know, there is where an, an intermediary or a scaling scientist or maybe a scaling champion or a practitioner should take over because once you start discussing now with governments or with uh, private sector, they are saying like, well, but the way this product is being designed, it will cost us 10 US dollars to produce. And, you know, if it costs us 10 US dollars to produce, we will not have a market for it. So we, we like the idea, we like the concept, but we need to scale it down or we need to unpack it again and make sure that this is something that we can produce and market for five US dollars so that it can be competitive in the market. And I think, you know, for a scientist, this is very difficult, you know, to support these kind of processes. It's a different mindset. It also for them will feel to a large extent that, you know, their, uh, what they thought was the best innovation that they could develop or the best technology that is being undone in, in, in a certain kind of way. But this is how scaling works. So probably what achieves impact at scale will uh, maybe look uh, like their best innovation for maybe 40%, but it still serves the same purpose, or maybe uh, in terms of quality, a little bit less, but still good enough. So my short answer will be, you need different kind of people with different kind of, kinds of competencies uh, along the pipeline. So thanks, Mark. So um, no, no, I'll move to the wrap up. Okay. Okay, good. So just to wrap up the session, I mean, some uh, takeaway messages from, from Mark's presentation. Actually, I think we, we've been lucky enough to attend to the presentation of the results of an editorial, which is only three weeks old. So uh, I, I personally like the way how Mark uh, presented the old way of scaling. Actually, you know, I think that we already seen that as an old thing of doing of all the way of doing research for development, because from now on, uh, things should be conceived, conceived different if we want to, to, to uh, conduct scaling in a, in a responsible way. So many things that, that we learn, and I, and I can imagine that many of us identify ourselves when he say that some researchers working on, this, on research for development are, very, are much more focused on technical aspects, not necessarily on the policy uh, and the broader picture aspects of, of scaling. Sometimes we provide the, 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 the wrong incentives that, and this is common to all the presentations, even the, the previous webinar, when, when we say that the demonstration plots, the way how we've been doing research, particularly in agronomy, uh, it doesn't show the reality of, a, of the specific, uh, it, it only shows the reality in one specific context and can, cannot be extrapolated uh, elsewhere. And that sometimes, you know, and this is pro pro more from my personal experience, like sometimes we ended up or we end up reporting unrealistic outcomes. And this is mainly driven by, by donors, right? And, and because we, we, we don't want, we, we don't want to, to lose the, the funding or we, any longer that we get in for our, that we need for our projects, but there seems it seems that there is hope on on this and by understanding the big picture of the innovation, building new partnership models with the key partners and look at the examples of other sectors for example for example all of that can help to to get the scaling better done, so and and many of the bottlenecks uh, could be overcome. So as I said, when I introduced Haley, I mean, she walked us through the principles of scaling and the way how uh, DRC uh, has conducted the studies, the, the justification, optimization scale, coordination, dynamic evaluation. And, and from both presentations, uh, what we can say is that, uh, and, and I, I, they got me when, when they mentioned some skills that I, that I didn't know at least, right? Which is discovery scientists, trial researchers, scaling champions. I mean, many of us working on research for development, we, we haven't been trained for, right? Even actually theory of change is something that is really, relatively really new to many of us. So that, that, this is something that to keep in mind and to probably to explore more about those four profiles because it certainly seems that is going to be needed in the future. So I think uh, that's it. Um, so we want to keep, me, to keep moving forward this topic, working together with Lena 
and uh, uh, ARD working group of the International uh, Cup on scale, community practice on scaling. And we want to keep moving forward this. Uh, it doesn't end with this webinar. We'll be very happy to facilitate the development of this, of, of this topic. Uh, so I don't know, Leonard, if you want to, to say something else. Well, just really thank you to the, to the speakers. I think IDRC and, uh, and the group of RTB have been really focusing on the science of scaling, putting the science in there. And that's been a really a great contribution. I was really happy that two of those proponents were able to, to join us today. And we had many great questions. The next webinar will be on the 29th of September on the art of scaling. So really about what kind of tools can you use to do your scaling in your project in a better way and how to really um, say, okay, well, this is my role and maybe this is not my role. And how do you build that in partnerships around scaling, right? So that will be next month. Uh, we're one minute over time. I'm going to say thank you and uh, goodbye to everyone. And um, see you next time. Thank Leonard, you so much. before we finish, I want to, um, just because we have so many questions, um, we're going to try to answer all your questions through an email that we will do after this so that everyone's answer uh, questions will, can be answered. Um, thank you all for joining. And as Leonard said, um, join us on September 29th for a third session of our webinar series. Thank you so much, Daniel, Leonard, Haley, and Mark, and everyone for joining us. Thank you. Ciao, ciao. Hi, thank you to everyone.